Okay, lecture number 11 here, we're going to talk about parathyroid hormone, PTH, and I am hoping that you guys learned about this hormone when you took Biology 201. We'll talk, a little, talk about it a little bit more here as we go over the endocrine system. So the parathyroid glands are these little itty bitty glands that are located on the posterior side of the thyroid. So what you are looking at here on this diagram, this is a posterior view. So actually up here you've got your pharynx back of the throat area that is leading down into the esophagus. So in blue over here that's the trachea and of course the thyroid is actually sitting anterior to the trachea but then its little wings there, its lobes on the left and the right wrap around the trachea um, and also around onto the sides of the esophagus. And then uh, right there, right there, right there, and right there, you've got four little parathyroid glands connected to the thyroid. Of course, that's being covered over on the anatomy side as well. Okay, so um, the number of these parathyroid glands can vary from person to per person. Uh, four, usually on diagrams they show four, but some people may have three, or it can be four to eight. Some people have as many as eight. They've got a couple of different kinds of cells inside them that actually look different if you look at them under the microscope. Um, when they've been dyed, they take up different colored dyes. And uh, one type are called oxyphil cells, and uh, it's still not known why those cells are in the parathyroid glands and what they're doing. Um, the other cells are called parathyroid cells, and they make PTH, or parathyroid hormone. And as you learn about when you study the skeletal system, this is the most important hormone in calcium ion homeostasis. And hopefully you remember from Biology 201, calcium levels very critical for muscular and nervous system functions. And really, calcium ions play uh, roles in the functions of probably every cell in your body. But uh, when we're thinking about body systems that are especially impacted by calcium, we think, tend to think of the muscular and the nervous systems. So it is very important that your body maintain calcium ion levels in your body fluids within normal homeostatic ranges. Okay, so if we think about calcium ion levels fluctuating over time, PTH is secreted when calcium ion levels are low. Okay, so when you dip down, PTH levels go up because of that, so the parathyroid glands secrete more of it, and PTH triggers calcium levels to go up in your body fluids, so those levels go back up. All right, and then when the levels are high, you have high calcium levels in your body fluids, PTH secretion goes down, and that allows your calcium levels to drop. And then when you get down into a little valley there with your calcium levels, the parathyroid glands sense that, and they start secreting more PTH, and increased PTH will help your calcium levels come back up. So it's, it's one of these negative feedback stories like we have seen before. All right, so the stimulus that triggers PTH secretion is hypocalcemia. So that term refers to low blood calcium. If it's low in the blood, it's going to be low in all of your body fluids as well. That's the stimulus. This is a tri type of humoral stimulation, if you remember that from an earlier lecture. Uh, low calcium levels, the, the parathyroid glands sense that themselves and they increase PTH production. So here are your effects of PTH over here. Hopefully you recall this one from Biology 201. It increases osteoclast activity. Osteoclasts are bone dissolving cells, if you remember. They uh, secrete acids, which help break down the calcium phosphate um, matrix that you have in your osseous tissues, and those calcium ions and the phosphate ions that are in the bone matrix 
end up in the blood. They get returned to the blood, and then the blood, of course, transports those all throughout the body. So that helps raise your calcium levels in the blood. Um, another thing that happens is PTH tells your kidneys to reabsorb more calcium from the urine. So when we study the kidneys later in the semester, you're going to see that uh, early urine that's being produced in the kidneys before it makes its way down to the bladder, um, you can reabsorb things that you need back out of that immature urine. We've already talked about how ADH triggers water to be reabsorbed out of the urine. Well, PTH tells the kidneys, hey, can calcium that's in the urine over there that's being formed, let's reabsorb that, let's suck that back out of the urine and return it to the bloodstream and to our body fluids. All right, and then um, another thing that PTH does is it causes the kidneys to activate vitamin D. So you guys may remember that um, in the skin, UV light uh, triggers vitamin D production in the skin. And it actually goes through more than one stage. So that vitamin D that's produced in the skin is not the active form. That has to go to the kidneys, and then the kidneys wind up activating it, which means that there are some changes to the chemical structure, some little subtle changes that now make it the active form. Active vitamin D really functions as a hormone. It travels to the small intestine and it tells the cells that are lining the small intestine, the inside space in there, to absorb more calcium out of the foods and the beverages that we can consume or enter in the process of digesting. So active vitamin D triggers more calcium uptake from the small intestine. All of these things help, you know, the ultimate goal here is to raise calcium ion levels in your body fluids. So again, if we're thinking about this as a negative feedback loop, calcium ion levels go up, then you shut down PTH production. You don't need as much PTH. That allows your calcium ion levels to drop. When you get down here again, the parathyroid hormones secrete PTH. All these good things happen, and that helps increase your calcium ion levels in your blood and other body fluids again. So PTH is a very important critical hormone for helping maintain calcium levels in our body fluids. Oh, also, what happens to that phosphate? So we say, you know, the uh, bone matrix contains, is made up of, maybe you remember hydroxyapatite ions, which are uh, mainly composed of calcium and phosphate ions bonded together. And so both of those types of ions get returned to the bloodstream by osteoclasts. The calcium we need, we don't need excess phosphate in our body fluids, so your kidneys, another thing that PTH does is it tells the kidneys, hey, go ahead and get rid of the phosphate, secrete that in the urine. Let's go ahead and eliminate that as a, as a waste. So that's what's being discussed there. All right, how about some homeostatic imbalances with PTH? This can occur, um, hyperparathyroidism can be due to a tumor. So if you have an overgrowth, a uh, proliferative tumor of the parathyroid, that would mean that the, uh, the parathyroid cells that make PTH are overgrowing. You have too many of them. And uh, you develop a mass or a tumor that's actually composed of those parathyroid cells. So guess what? They're all going to be responding to low calcium levels in the body fluids and they're all going to be cranking out PTH. And a lot of times when you have a tumor you lose any sort of negative feedback control that might take place so they might just continue to produce PTH even when it's not needed. And so what's that going to cause? Uh, your bones may soften and uh, deform. That makes sense because PTH increased osteoclasts or osteoclast activity would be a better way of saying that. You dissolve too much bony matrix. It can lead to osteoporosis or even a more extreme type of uh, osteoporosis. Also your calcium ion levels 
are going to be too high and that's going to interfere with the um, function of the nervous system, the muscular system, and um, can also lead to kidney stones being formed as well. That might be uh, one of the signs of a hyperparathyroidism. Calcium, when it's really highly concentrated, uh, can form crystals or stones that can get lodged in the uh, ureters. And those would be kidney stones. That does not mean if you ever get a kidney stone that it's uh, that you have hyperparathyroidism. This is not the normal cause of of kidney stones. There are other types of kidney stones that can be formed, and uh, usually they are not due to hyperparathyroidism. So if you or somebody you love gets a kidney stone, it does not mean that they have that condition. Hypoparathyroidism, on the other hand, that's low secretion of PDH, uh, PTH. That can occur. Uh, what if you're the parathyroid glands are accidentally damaged or some sort of a trauma or you know sometimes people have to have their thyroid glands removed like due to thyroid cancer and it may be difficult to make to keep the parathyroid glands in place um, also dietary mag uh, magnesium deficiency can lead to hypoparathyroidism as well interestingly enough so um, some of the things that this can lead to muscular system malfunctions uh, you can wind up uh, having muscles that stay in a contracted state, tetany. You remember that from when you studied the muscular system. Respiratory paralysis, if your diaphragm is staying in a contracted state, it can't relax, that's not going to be good and it can actually lead to death. So hypoparathyroidism is not a, uh, not a good thing to experience especially if it winds up interfering with your muscle function and, and breathing. All right, so that was just an overview of what happens with PTH, a very important hormone. And uh, the next lectures, we're going to start moving on to the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands, the glands that sit on top of your kidneys, make a number of different hormones um, that have very different roles in terms of uh, our bodily functions, and they're pretty interesting and some pretty interesting disorders associated with those as well. So that's what we'll be moving on to for the uh, 12th lecture for the endocrine system.